Hello guys and welcome back. If you are new around here, I cover mostly Australian cases and today we are covering another solved case. And honestly, this is a case that I thought I would never cover because to me, it felt like the quintessential Aussie case that everybody already knew. But I think what I've come to realize is what everyone knows is the ever so popular phrase, a dingo ate my baby, usually said with an offensively bad Australian accent. It's pretty much become a part of our pop culture thanks to shows such as The Simpsons, Seinfeld, Buffy, The Rugrats, The Office, and it's also been emblazoned onto t-shirts, mugs, magnets, you name it, I have seen it over the years. You get the point though, it's a reference that we all recognise. But how many of you actually know the story behind the incredibly sad case of baby Azaria Chamberlain and her parents, Lindy and Michael? And as I always do say on these larger cases, keep in mind, this is an overview only, therefore I'll be discussing the key points only. So with that, let's get into today's case. So heading back to the year of 1980, on June 11, Lindy and Michael Chamberlain welcomed their first daughter into the world. The married couple already had two sons, Aidan born in 1973 and Regan born in 1975. But they had desperately wanted a little baby girl and their dreams came true when Azaria Chantel Lauren Chamberlain was born. So before we go any further, let's talk more about Lindy and Michael. Alice Lynn Murchison, or Lindy as she became known, was born on March 4, 1948 in Wakatani, New Zealand, but moved to Victoria, Australia just before her second birthday. In 1969, Lindy married Seventh-day Adventist church pastor Michael Chamberlain. Coincidentally, Lindy's father was also a pastor, and another coincidence, actually, Michael was also born in New Zealand. Lindy and Michael soon moved to Tasmania, which is a little triangle at the bottom of Australia, <laughs> shortly after getting married. Due to Michael's work, which often required he moved around a lot, and this is where they had their first son, Aiden. Not too long after this, the Chamberlains moved again for Michael's work and they moved to Queensland and this is where they had their second son, Regan. As well as being a mum of two, Lindy worked as a dressmaker specialising in wedding dresses. And a little about Michael, Michael Lee Chamberlain was born on February 27, 1944 in Christchurch, New Zealand. He moved to Australia in 1965, which is where he became a Seventh-day Adventist church pastor. And by the way, if you were wondering what the Seventh-day Adventist church is, honestly, I don't really know. From my five minutes of Googling, it seems to be part of Christianity. But as I myself am not religious and I know very little about any religion, I'm not going to try and explain it beyond that. But feel free to explain it in the comments if you are familiar with it. And I only bring this up because the Chamberlain's religion does become somewhat relevant in this story, but we will discuss that a little bit later. So the Chamberlains eventually settled in Mount Isa, Queensland, and this is where in 1980 they had baby Azaria. So now we're going to skip ahead about nine weeks after Azaria is born, so we're in the middle of August and the Chamberlains are heading off on their first holiday as a family of five. And the holiday is a road trip and they'll be starting in the Northern Territory. So on August 13, the Chamberlains all pack into their bright yellow Holden Tirana hatchback. And by the way, what a great looking classic little 1970s car. But anyway, <laughs> they pack themselves in and their camping equipment and off they head towards their first stop, Uluru, also known as Ayers Rock, which is about a 14 hour drive from where they are, according to Google Maps. And if you are unfamiliar with Uluru, it is that big red rock smack bang in the middle of Australia. It takes the Chamberlains three days to reach Uluru, arriving to their campsite quite late on the 16th. And their plan is to stay at this campsite for three days before driving up to Darwin. And the drive to Darwin, although it is in the same state 
as Uluru is about 20 hours. Just in case you weren't aware yet of just how big Australia is. So because they did arrive pretty late that day, Lindy and Michael pretty much just set up their tents and get her settled in with their kids for the night. And this campsite, by the way, is right next to Uluru. I'll pop a photo up on the screen, but when I say it is right next to it, I mean right next to it. The next day, Aiden, who was now six, and Regan, who was now four, go with their father to climb parts of Uluru, while Lindy and Azaria do a little bit of their own exploring at a place called Fertility Cave. And this is where Lindy first spots some dingoes. She would later say that she felt the dingoes had been leering at Azaria, making her feel incredibly uneasy around them. Now, I'm not sure how much knowledge tourists had back then about dingoes, and I'm not sure how much knowledge you, dear viewer, have on them either. So let me give you a quick overview as to what a dingo is. So dingoes are wild dogs found in Australia, mostly in outback locations that look just like your average cute, friendly neighborhood dog, but they are not. Now I fly to places that have dingoes and I have had a few run-ins with them. I'll insert some photos if I can find them. By the way, if you are new around here, hi, I'm a flight attendant. <laughs> and one of the places I fly is to Pilbara, which basically is the middle of nowhere Australia. Anyway, there is a few rules when it comes to dingoes. Don't touch them, don't pat them, and for the love of God, don't feed them. If you ignore them, they will pretty much ignore you. But the moment you start feeding the dingoes is when they start to feel comfortable around humans, and that's when a dingo attack can happen. And when they attack, they are bloody vicious, and they can kill you. By the way, if you ever do encounter a dingo, stop, cross your arms, and start walking backwards and call for help. <laughs> That's about all the advice that I can give you. But don't turn around, don't turn your back on them, just slowly walk backwards, standing tall with your arms crossed. Anyway, not that any of you are probably going to see a dingo anytime soon, but now you know. <laughs> so back to the 17th, a few more bits of information for context regarding dingoes at this campsite. Firstly, Michael had been feeding the dingoes. He was feeding them bread crust, which Lindy did actually discourage him from doing, telling him that he was only encouraging them to stick around, and she was right. But this is not to put the blame on Michael, by the way, because it was pretty common practice, from what I can gather at least, to feed the dingoes at this campsite. And actually at the time, the campsite's toilets had put up some new posters and the posters warned tourists to not feed the dingoes. Now the problem with these new posters were when these dingoes were so used to a food source from humans at this campsite and it suddenly cut off, the dingoes can become even more aggressive than usual. In fact, just two months previous, a three-year-old girl had been dragged from her family's car by a dingo. Luckily, her parents did quickly intervene and she was okay. Furthermore, two years previous to that, Uluru Chief Ranger Derek Roth had warned of an imminent possible fatal dingo attack if a cull did not happen, but he was pretty much ignored. It seems to me like tourists really were not adequately warned of the dangers of dingoes, likely to keep the tourist numbers up, and a number of people at the campsite at the time the Chamberlains were there actually did note that dingoes had been lurking around, following people carrying food, and just simply watching them. So it was clearly an issue. And unfortunately, I think what happened next was a tragic incident waiting to happen. On the evening of the 17th at around 6pm, after a long and exhausting day of exploring, the Chamberlains put their youngest son, Regan, to bed in their tent. After that, Michael, Lindy, Aiden and baby Azaria gathered around a campfire with several other families staying at the campsite. 
and as the families cooked up a barbecue together, they all really got to know each other and became friendly. In particular, Lindy and Michael really clicked with another couple camping with their baby daughter, Greg and Sally Lowe. Those that spoke to the Chamberlains that night described them as friendly, likeable, and really just your average family. At around 8pm, Lindy announced to the other campers, it's time to put Bubby down, and headed off to the tent where Regan was sleeping. Aiden followed his mum to the tent, but he did decide to stay up a little bit longer as he was a bit hungry. Baby Azaria was put to bed in her cot, and she was wearing a singlet, nappy, white jumpsuit, booties and a yellow matinee jacket. Not long after this, Greg Lowe sees Lindy and Aiden heading towards the Chamberlain's car to fetch some baked beans for a very hungry Aiden. And about 15 minutes after leaving to put Azaria down, Lindy and Aiden return to the campfire. And it's not too long after this point that Lindy and Michael hear Azaria scream. Sally Lowe also hears it. And this scream was described as short and sharp before suddenly cutting off. It was the type of scream that indicated that something was very wrong. Of course, Lindy immediately gets up to see what is going on. And as she's heading back to the tent, she sees what looks like a dingo emerging from the tent with one of Michael's shoes in its mouth. Lindy, who had left the tent zipper undone because of how close they were to the tent from the campfire, and of course not realising that there was any real danger, starts to sprint towards the tent, concerned for her two sleeping children. By this point, the dingo she had seen had disappeared into the darkness. Lindy dives into the tent and frantically begins searching for Azaria, pulling back the blankets in her white wicker cot, but finds nothing. She also checks Regan and he is okay. Later, Lindy does find out that Regan did see the dingo, but he was frozen with fear and had pretty much decided it was best to play dead. And it's at this point that Lindy runs back to the campsite and utters the line, my God, my God, a dingo's got my baby. Followed by, has anyone got a torch? Hundreds joined the search at Oolaroo that night, including local Aboriginal trackers. The local police were of course also informed and soon show up to examine the scene. When the police are told of what happened, that a dingo had taken a baby, they considered this pretty unusual as it had never happened to the best of their knowledge at least. But I think at the time they did accept this explanation. So police examined the scene, particularly the tent, and several things were noted. There were dingo or dog tracks inside and around the tent. There was also a fair amount of blood and later dog hairs were also found in the tent. And no, the Chamberlains did not own a dog. The Aboriginal trackers also made several discoveries from following the dingo's tracks. They found drag marks followed by two separate shallow impressions in the sand with the imprint appearing to be that of a knitted garment. And a third darker patch of sand thought to be blood. The unusual story of a dingo taking a baby quickly made headlines across Australia. But despite the extensive search over the coming days, baby Azaria was never located. One week later, on August 24, a tourist from Melbourne, Wally Goodwin, was exploring Uluru when he came across a small, bloody baby's jumpsuit. He immediately knew that it must belong to missing baby Azaria Chamberlain and contacted the authorities. The discovery was made about four kilometers or two and a half miles from the campsite and along with the jumpsuit, Azaria's singlet, nappy and booties were found but the matinee jacket that Lindy said Azaria had been wearing that night remained missing. So the condition in which the jumpsuit was found in became one of the biggest talking points of this investigation. And of course, one of the key pieces of evidence. I'll have a photo up on the screen, but basically the jumpsuit had blood stains around the neck area, was dirty of course, had a few tears here and there, but besides that, was in remarkably good condition considering what had happened to Azaria. And this was one of the things that I guess really confused investigators. 
and made them question the Chamberlain's story. After all, if Azaria had been taken by a dingo and, let's face it, eaten, how was the jumpsuit not torn to absolute shreds? We're talking about wild dingoes here after all. Did the dingo carefully remove the jumpsuit before attacking? It just didn't make sense to a lot of people. But we will get back to that point in just a moment. Skipping ahead several months, the Chamberlains have since returned home to Mount Isa and vicious rumours about Lindy and Michael were not only swirling in their local community, but in the media and therefore across Australia. And the public opinion was really split at this time. Some believed the Chamberlains were innocent victims, and others believed that they had completely made up the whole dingo story. Some rumours even said that they sacrificed Azaria as part of a religious ritual. And this was just the beginning of the awful rumours. But we'll discuss all of that in just a little bit. Soon, a coronial inquest into Azaria's disappearance and presumed death began in Darwin. The Chamberlains would finally have a chance to clear their name once and for all. And in February of the next year, 1981, they did just that. Coroner Dennis Barrett, or Barrett, concluded that it was indeed a dingo that had taken Azaria and that she had died as a result. However, the Northern Territory Police, as well as the NT Supreme Court, were not satisfied with these findings because, you know, dingoes eating babies was kind of bad for tourism. And in September of that same year, based off new evidence, the Chamberlain's home was raided for four and a half hours, with over 300 items being confiscated, including the yellow tirana. So this new evidence that I mentioned came from a British forensic scientist, James Cameron, who had examined the jumpsuit and concluded that Azaria had not died as a result of a dingo attack and that the tears on the jumpsuit were most likely a pair of scissors, not from dingo teeth. This was kind of but not really backed up by a pair of scissors that had been confiscated from the Chamberlain's home that supposedly had blood on them. And as I said, the Tirana was also confiscated and subsequently examined. A forensic report on the findings of this examination eventually came back and claimed the following. Blood stains had been found on the front seat of the vehicle, the passenger seat hinge, on the floor under the carpet, and most notably, on the underside of the dashboard where they had found a spray of blood. A camera bag also confiscated contained some of these stains. And I should clarify, this was a substance that they thought to be blood. Let me explain. The stains were of course tested and came back positive for containing something called fetal haemoglobin. Now, I'm not about to get sciencey on you, but basically, fetal haemoglobin is a protein found in babies under six months old. However, fetal haemoglobin is also known to show up in other random things, including occasionally adults, nose mucus. So, if Azaria had sneezed in the car, that would leave traces of fetal haemoglobin. And the strangest one of all, chocolate milkshakes. Don't even ask me how that one works. <laughs> so as a result of the blood evidence, as well as James Cameron's evidence, uh, the, the forensic scientist, not the movie director, <laughs> the first inquest's findings were quashed and a second inquest was ordered. And as a result of this second inquest, in February of 1982, Lindy Chamberlain was charged with the murder of her daughter, Azaria, and Michael Chamberlain was charged with being an accessory after the fact. At this point, the Northern Territory government gave Lindy an option. She could either admit guilt and walk free, or continue to protest her innocence and go to trial, with a high chance of ending up in jail for the rest of her life. But Lindy stuck to her guns 
as did Michael, insisting that they were both innocent. And I think the fact that the NT government even gave Lindy this option proves a point. It proves that Lindy had obviously embarrassed the NT and caused damage to tourism. They simply didn't want a dingo to be considered responsible, no matter what the cost. They'd rather have the public believe they had let a baby killer walk free than them thinking that a dingo had killed a baby. And that, I think, speaks volumes. On September 13, 1982, the trial, which was a trial by jury, began in Darwin. And by this point, Lindy was heavily pregnant with her fourth child. And side note, the fact that they had a jury for this trial blows my damn mind. But anyway, during the trial, the Crown outlined their own theory, based on evidence, as to what had happened to baby Azaria back in August of 1980. And by the way, if you're wondering what the Crown is, in the simplest terms possible, it's to do with the British Commonwealth law system. So the Crown refers to the Queen, and the Crown's role is to basically act as a Minister for Justice and present all evidence without bias. Not that I think they managed to do that in this case, but anyway, a good example, since I know most of my viewers are based in the US, would be something like the state of California versus OJ Simpson. The state of California is the crown. So moving on, their theory went along these lines. When Lindy left the campfire for 15 minutes to put Azaria to bed, instead of taking her to the tent, she took her to their car and in the car, it's alleged that she sat in the passenger seat, cut Azaria's throat with a sharp object, a likely nail scissors, and stuffed her body in a large camera bag. Michael, by the way, was a pretty big photography enthusiast, which is why they had a large camera bag with them. And let's keep in mind, not only would Lindy somehow needed to have gotten rid of Aiden, who had followed her to the tent, but Greg Lowe had witnessed Lindy, Azaria, and Aiden walking to the tent, and then minutes later, walking without Azaria to their car. The Crown also claims that at some point, Lindy told Michael what she did, and Michael was apparently totally cool with the knowledge that his wife had just killed his newborn baby daughter, and then they both pretended to hear Azaria cry after Lindy returned to the campfire and fed Aiden, even though Sally Lowe had also heard this cry. Other campers there that night also attested to the fact that they did believe the Chamberlains were innocent. In fact, every person that had been questioned that was there that night claimed the Chamberlains had not been acting strange or suspicious. And as I said, they all believed they were innocent, every single one of them. On top of this, nobody there saw any blood on Lindy after she returned from putting Azaria to bed, which is pretty remarkable considering she had apparently just slit a child's throat. In court, the Crown called the dingo theory a fanciful lie calculated to conceal the truth. So for the Crown's theory to work, Lindy needed to somehow smuggle her daughter to their car, kill her, clean herself up and the crime scene, and then set up this alternative crime scene in her tent all in 15 minutes without anybody noticing. Oh, and then there's Azaria's body, which the Crown alleges that she buried later that night while everybody was out searching. Hundreds of people which I must say would have been a pretty ballsy move. And of course, lastly, Azaria's clothing, which again the Crown claims Lindy had put little cuts in with the scissors that she used to cut Azaria's throat, rubbed the jumpsuit and the clothing in the dirt, and disposed of them to make it all look like a dingo attack. And as for the Chamberlain's motive... Well, one was never presented. By all accounts, Azaria was a very much wanted and nurtured little girl. And in my opinion, the Crown's theory left a lot 
of unanswered questions. And now let's quickly go over the evidence presented at the trial. Experts who examined the jumpsuit said they found no trace of animal saliva and no drag marks that would be consistent with a dingo dragging a baby. And Lindy's response to this was that this was because Azaria was wearing a matinee jacket covering her jumpsuit. But unfortunately, this jacket had not been located at the time. And because of this, the Crown claimed that such a jacket had never even existed. Other experts also agreed with forensic scientist James Cameron that the tears on the jumpsuit had been cut with a sharp instrument. And biologist Dr. Andrew Scott claimed in court that the blood marks around the neck of the jumpsuit flowed down, indicating that Azaria's throat had been cut. And of course, the blood evidence from the Tirana was presented, described by the Crown as being a wash with blood, when in fact there was only about a teaspoon found in total through the vehicle of a substance that may not even be blood. It's also worth noting that the Chamberlains and their defence team had no access to any of this evidence and were not allowed to do any of their own testing, which really screwed them over. And to the jury, it made them look like they had something to hide. And again, we bring up our mate, James Cameron, who presented ultraviolet fluorescent photographs of Azaria's jumpsuit that he pointed out showed a small bloody handprint. He also stated, quote, there was an incised wound around the neck of the jumpsuit, in other words, a cut throat. Another thing worth noting is the way a lot of the scientific evidence was presented to the jury was very technically worded and quite frankly confusing. The jury would later state they didn't really understand a lot of the evidence that was being presented to them. Do keep in mind though that as I said at the beginning, this is a quick overview of some of the key evidence. I do have all my resources linked down below as always, so if you'd like to do a deep dive of your own, everything you need is right down there. Now let's quickly touch on the most hotly disputed point of this case. Not that this entire case wasn't disputed, but anyway, let's talk about if a dingo is even capable of actually picking up a baby, carrying it off, removing its clothing without tearing it to shreds and eating it. So first off, a dingo's teeth are very sharp and very strong. They prey on, kill and carry animals such as kangaroos, wallabies, wombats, koalas, rabbits and cats. So a nine week old baby really would be no challenge for them. And as far as the condition of Azaria's jumpsuit, evidence was presented by engineer Les Harris, who at that point had spent 10 years studying dingoes. And he showed a female dingo that was given a bundle of meat wrapped in paper and how this dingo managed to remove the paper to get to the meat while leaving the paper relatively intact, which honestly is Pretty remarkable. On October 29, 1982, after a 33 day trial, a verdict was finally reached. Lindy Chamberlain was found guilty of murder and Michael Chamberlain was found guilty of being an accessory after the fact. This verdict was met by cheers and comments from the public such as, we got the bitch. People even wore t-shirts to court that read, the dingo is innocent. But we'll discuss more of this public reaction in just one moment. As I touched on a moment ago, having a jury was pretty much a shit show. One juror even told their neighbour how happy they were to be part of this jury so they could get the bitch. When as we know, a jury is meant to be a neutral, fair and unbiased group of people. And speaking of which, the jury was made up of 12 white Northern Territorian residents consisting of nine men and three women. I wouldn't exactly call that fair, I don't know about you. And their original verdict was actually four guilty, four not guilty and four undecided, before eventually all being swayed to vote guilty somehow. Lindy was eventually sentenced to a life in prison and Michael got an 18 month suspended sentence. And as I mentioned before, Lindy was pregnant and went on to give birth in November of 1982 in Darwin Hospital while still in custody. 
she gave birth to a second little baby girl who she named Kalia Chanel Nikari Chamberlain. But sadly, within hours of giving birth to Kalia, she was taken away from Lindy and placed into foster care. Of course, Lindy did appeal her sentence over the next several years, but was unsuccessful. So now we're going to jump ahead a few years to 1986. Lindy has been sitting in Darwin's Barramar prison for about three years at this point. And an irrelevant side note, by all accounts, Lindy was a really good prisoner. She was well behaved, got along with everyone and supported other female inmates in the prison which I think is pretty remarkable given her own circumstances. Now we're about to go off on a bit of a seemingly unrelated story, but stay with me. In February of 86, English tourist David Brett was on a holiday in the Northern Territory visiting Australia's famous Big Red Rock. And as many tourists did back then, he decided to climb Uluru, which by the way is actually pretty dangerous. About 30 people have died over the years doing so, and unfortunately, David became one of these people. He lost his footing and fell to his death, and it would be eight days until his remains were discovered, lying outside a dingo's lair. Oh, by the way, climbing Uluru is now actually banned, not because it's dangerous, but because it's considered a sacred land by the landowners, the Anagu people. Anyway, when investigators were searching for other parts of David's remains, they came across an interesting item sitting just outside a dingo's lair, a little yellow matinee jacket found just a few hundred metres from where Azaria's jumpsuit had been discovered six years earlier. Now, you would think the police would immediately contact the Chamberlains and let them know about this groundbreaking discovery, proving that Lindy was telling the truth all along. But no, it was actually Lindy's lawyer, Stuart Tipple, that found out about it after receiving a tip-off that a matinee jacket had been found at Uluru. Days later, Lindy viewed the jacket and identified it as belonging to baby Azaria. So before we continue on, I do want to go over the media and public's reaction to this entire case over the years, as well as the bizarre rumours and theories that were spread about the Chamberlains. One of the key things that made the public believe Lindy was guilty, aside from the unusual circumstances of Azaria's disappearance, was her attitude. She showed little to no emotion and I guess the public expected a woman that had just lost her baby to somehow act differently, even though there really is no right or wrong way to act in these situations. And Lindy was truly crucified for what was considered a cold and distant attitude. And as a result, the majority of the Aussie public did believe that Lindy was guilty of killing her own baby. And of course, Lindy was also crucified for what she wore to court. Or what's new though, a woman being criticised for what they wear? It's like nothing has changed in 40 years. She wore comfortable, strappy, flowy, fashionable dresses, but the public viewed her looks as a fashion parade for the media. And the vilification of Lindy Chamberlain has long been considered the reason that she was found guilty in court. So I guess you could call this Australia's original trial by media. Lindy would later state... If I smiled, I was belittling my daughter's death. If I cried, I was acting. And then there's the rumours and conspiracies. Everything was said about this family, from claiming they worshipped the devil, to Lindy being a witch, to saying that they sacrificed Zaria. And the root of these rumours came from the following. First off, their religion. A little information was known about the Seventh-day Adventist church back then, and honestly, I would argue that people even today don't know much about it, myself included. But back then, because of ignorance, I guess, people started calling it a cult that sacrificed babies in rituals. Rumours even swirled that the Chamberlains had connections with Jonestown, which had happened just two years earlier. 
and the baby sacrifice rumour was fueled by the fact that a completely false rumour was started saying that the name Azaria in Hebrew meant sacrifice in the wilderness when in reality it meant God helped. It's really proof that people fear what they don't understand, isn't it? <laughs> Then there's the fact that the Chamberlains had black coloured baby clothing. Shocking, I know. One outfit in particular did the rounds, a black dress with red ribbon and matching red booties. I'll have the outfit on the screen for you, but seriously, I would dress my baby in this. It's cute as heck. It really does seem like society fears anyone that strays from the norm because people started saying that the Chamberlains dressed Azaria in the devil's colours, which is absolute madness. Another item confiscated from the Chamberlains' home years earlier was a baby-sized coffin. And without context, yes, this is weird as heck, but Michael said he used the coffin as part of a scare tactic slash anti-smoking campaign during his work as a pastor. Still a bit odd, but it does make sense. And as I mentioned earlier, as no motive was presented in court, the media and the public made up their own, of course. They said that Azaria had been a sickly child or had a disability, and that's why Lindy wanted to get rid of her, which isn't true at all. And then, of course, we have to mention the running joke that hasn't died off in 40 years, fueled by endless mentions throughout pop culture. And that's a dingo ate my baby. Unfortunately, it became even more of a joke after the movie Evil Angels was released in 1988. Called A Cry in the Dark outside of Australia and New Zealand, it starred Meryl Streep and was, of course, based on this entire case. But we are jumping a little bit ahead here. The movie did actually take the side of the Chamberlains, but failed to really swing the public's opinion. And as to why this quote became such a running joke, it really is hard to say, I guess. Just the fact that it keeps repeating itself, I suppose, doesn't help. And it is pretty unfortunate that it did become what it did, considering the story behind the quote. And I imagine as a result that Lindy has probably never been able to forget that day in 1980. I even saw some incredibly offensive t-shirt designs during my research and it really it amazes me how many people seem to have forgotten that a little baby girl lost her life that day. So now back to the matinee jacket. A week after its discovery, Lindy was released from prison. Following her release, a Royal Commission inquiry was held and the original forensic evidence was examined where some extraordinary revelations came to light. So the fetal haemoglobin found in the Chamberlain's vehicle turned out to be nothing more than sound deadening spray, which is basically something sprayed in cars during manufacturing to give them better sound insulation. And unfortunately for the Chamberlain's, it also happens to test positive for fetal haemoglobin. And in fact, in 10% of this car model, the deadening spray was found splashed on the underside of the dashboard. A milkshake and copper dust was also found to be part of other stains that were originally thought to be blood. And the copper dust came from the fact that Mount Isa is a copper town. And forensic expert James Cameron's evidence was also re-examined. So the small bloody handprint he claimed was visible under the ultraviolet lights turned out to be nothing more than red dirt. And the tears on the jumpsuit were also later found to indeed be consistent with a dingo attack. Following these findings, the administrator for the Northern Territory pardoned the Chamberlains, to which Lindy responded somewhat sarcastically, well, it's great to be pardoned for something you haven't done. As it is, the convictions stand. So a pardon, by the way, doesn't exactly mean that you're not guilty, but it just means that they can't prove that you did it anymore. In 1988, all convictions against Lindy and Michael Chamberlain were finally overturned and they were compensated $1.3 million, which mostly did go towards their legal fees. 
Despite all of this, many people in the public still consider the Chamberlains guilty. So now we're skipping ahead to 1995. A third coronial inquest was held where the coroner concluded, quote, the cause and manner of death is unknown. In other words, they weren't saying that a dingo did it and they weren't saying that Lindy didn't do it, but really they didn't know how Azaria died and they couldn't prove either way. Or of course, they just didn't want to pin the blame on a dingo because, you know, tourism. Believe it or not, a fourth and praise be to God final inquest was eventually held and it was relatively recent actually considering when this all began. In 2012 a coroner finally ruled that a dingo was responsible for the death of Azaria Chamberlain and a death certificate with a cause of death was finally issued to the Chamberlains, once and for all clearing Lindy and Michael's names, in the eyes of the law at least. Since Azaria's death in 1980, there have actually been a number of dingo attacks on children, with another ending fatally in 2001. Sadly, a nine-year-old boy was attacked and killed on Fraser Island, which is just off the coast of Queensland. So all in all, it took 32 years for Azaria's death to be ruled as what Lindy had said it was all along, a dingo attack. And sadly, to this day, Azaria's remains have never been found. So I do want to super briefly update you on the Chamberlain's lives since 1980 outside of this tragedy. Lindy and Michael did actually divorce in 1991 and the following year, Lindy met and married an American that she had met on a speaking tour of the US named Rick Creighton. The couple lived in the US for a couple of years but soon returned to Australia and yes, Lindy did get all three of her children back whom she shared with Michael. Over the years, Lindy says she has received roughly 40,000 letters, most in support of her, but some are not. And all of these have actually been donated to a museum, along with a number of other things related to the case. She also released a book called Through My Eyes, and in 2002, an opera based on the case debuted called Lindy. I'm not even kidding, a bit strange. <laughs> And Michael Chamberlain unfortunately did pass away in 2017 due to complications from leukemia. At the heart of this case though, no matter what you believe, I think we almost all forget that an innocent little almost 10 week old baby girl lost their life that day in a truly horrific way. So thank you for being here and listening to Azaria's story and listening to the Chamberlain's story because they are victims as well. Thank you to my amazing channel members. You are all absolute stars. Until next time, stay vigilant, stay safe, and I will see you very soon. Bye guys.